I think it's time for this toxic, binary, zero-sum madness to stop. We're not an imperial power. We're a revolutionary power. We are no longer in a world where you can plot out moves, statesman to statesman, like a chessboard. You don't know anything about my background or where I came from. It doesn't matter to you because fundamentally I'm a mean white man. We can't do this to the next generation because America will cease to exist. Welcome to the Monk Debates Podcast. Every episode, we provide you with a civil and substantive debate on the big issues of the day. Free of spin, focused on the facts, and animated by smart conversation. To arm you, the listener, with enough information to make up your own mind. Today's debate, be it resolved, men are obsolete. Hello, I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. Well, since the beginning of human civilization, men have been the dominant sex. But now, for the first time, a host of indicators suggest that women are not only achieving equality with men, but are fast emerging as the more successful sex of our species. Women now make up the majority of university degree holders, and while women's participation in the workforce is on the rise, the opposite is true for men. Joining me from Philadelphia... A new study claims one reason behind the steady decline in the United States marriages is a shortage of, quote, economically attractive men. Cornell University fact, researchers... By that measure, women chief executives have made more than their male counterparts over the last five years. That's according to a new equal... Critics of the argument that men are in decline argue that the age-old power structures associated with maleness remain as entrenched as ever. They say that men still retain significant control over the workplace, the family, and society at large. On Thursday, the last woman with a viable shot at the nomination left the race, leading to the reality for many women that no matter which party wins for four more years, the White House will once again be occupied by a white man. On a previous main stage monk debate at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, four leading female public intellectuals examined the question of where the sexes are headed in the 21st century. Here for your listening pleasure is an abridged podcast version of this memorable monk debate. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the monk debates. My name is Rudyard Griffiths, and it's my privilege to act as both the organizer of this debate series and to once again serve as your moderator. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we want to expand the focus of this debate for the first time beyond geopolitics, beyond international economics, to consider one of the big sociological questions of our time, that being the decline of the performance of men relative to women in the family, in the workplace, in schools and universities, and in once all male bastions such as politics and business. Is this a broad and permanent trend in post-industrial societies such as Canada? One that will fundamentally reshape family life, gender relations, our workplace, and society at large? Or, and it's a big or, are the millennial old power structures, economic, political, cultural, created by men, for men, still firmly embedded in our society, suggesting that men and maleness is anything but a spent civilizational force? Speaking first for the motion, be it resolved, men are obsolete, is the senior editor of The Atlantic Magazine, the author of the definitive international bestseller, on tonight's topic, The End of Men. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Hannah Rosen. Thank you, Hannah. Joining Ms. Rosen on the pro side of the debate is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, the author of her own big book on this subject, Are Men Necessary? And as we know her so well, a celebrated New York Times columnist, please welcome her first time to Toronto, Maureen Dowd. Now, let's get our second team of presenters out here, center stage. She's rightly lauded as one of the world's top public intellectuals. She's the author of a string of iconic books on gender and culture. She writes regularly everywhere from the New York Times 
to The Hollywood Reporter. We know her well. Ladies and gentlemen, Camille Paglia. <laughs> Ms. Paglia's debating partner is a cultural phenom in her own right. She is a cultural critic, uh, TV critic at the Times of London, and the author of a big global bestseller and new feminist anthem, How to Be a Woman. Direct from London, England, Catelyn Moore. So it's now time for our debate to formally get underway. Our speakers, as I mentioned, have six minutes each. As is customary, the pro side will speak first. Hannah Rosen, you're up. Wow, there's a surprising number of men out there. <laughs> That's really not good for us, but we'll try. Um, are men literally obsolete? Of course not. If we had to prove that, we could never win this debate. For one thing, we haven't figured out how to harvest their sperm without, you know, keeping them alive. <laughs> it's the end of men because men are failing in the workplace. Over the last few decades, men's incomes have been slowly declining while women's incomes slowly rise. Last year, only one in five men were not working, something that economists call the greatest social crisis we might face. Partly this is because the global economy has been changing rapidly and men are failing to adjust. Meanwhile, women are moving in the opposite direction. In 2009, they became the majority of the American workforce for the first time in history. And now in every part of America, young single women have a higher median income than single men, which is incredibly important because that's the age when women and men are sizing each other up and deciding what their futures are going to look like. As one sorority girl I talked to about her boyfriend put it to me, and remember sorority girl, not the president of the Women's Studies Center, men are the new ball and chain. <laughs> it's the end of men because men are failing in schools and women are succeeding. In nearly every country on all but one continent, women are getting about 60% of college degrees, which is what you need to succeed these days. And boys start to fall behind as early as first grade, and many of them just can't catch up. It's the end of men because the traditional household, which was propped up by the male breadwinner, is quickly vanishing. Women and men learn their social roles at home. Man hunter, woman gatherer, man breadwinner, woman homemaker. But that whole hierarchy is completely broken down. Now we have a new global type called the alpha wife, a woman who earns more money than her husband. In the 70s, this was a totally rare breed. You could rarely find her. And now she makes up about 40% of American couples. Women are occupying positions of power that were once totally closed off to them. The end of men is even more prominent in the working class. When I speak to working class communities, the women in the audience look at me like what I'm saying is totally, completely obvious. The working class is where the men are losing their jobs and losing their roles in their families, and women are doing almost everything, creating virtual matriarchies in the parts of the country that used to be our bastions of macho traditional values. And when I ask these women, why don't you live with the father of your children? They say to me, shrugging, because he would be just another mouth to feed. I heard that many times, many times when I was reporting. It's the end of men because men have lost their monopoly on violence and aggression. Women are becoming more sexually confident, and something Camille might appreciate, more aggressive in both good ways and bad. Going to war, going to jail, playing sports, and in the case of the Real Housewives of New Jersey, beating up anyone who knocks a drink out of their hand. <laughs> we don't want to castrate men, we don't want to turn them into eunuchs, we don't even want to feminize them that much. We just want to keep whatever we love about manhood and adjust the parts that are holding men back. Good evening. If men are obsolete, then women will soon be extinct unless we rush down that ominous, brave new world path where females will clone themselves by parthenogenesis, as famously do Komodo dragons, hammerhead sharks, and pit vipers. A peevish, grudging rancor against men has been one of the most unpalatable and unjust features of second and third wave feminism. Men's faults, failings, and foibles have been seized on and magnified into gruesome bills of indictment. Ideologue professors at our leading universities indoctrinate impressionable undergraduates with carelessly fact-free theories alleging that gender is an arbitrary, oppressive fiction with no basis in biology. It was always the proper mission of feminism to attack and reconstruct 
the ossified social practices that had led to wide-ranging discrimination against women, but surely it was and is possible for a progressive reform movement to achieve that without stereotyping, belittling, or demonizing men. History must be seen clearly and fairly. Obstructive traditions arose, not from men's hatred or enslavement of women, but from the natural division of labor that had developed over thousands of years during the agrarian period and that once immensely benefited and protected women, permitting them to remain at the hearth to care for helpless infants and children. Over the past century, it was labor-saving appliances invented by men and spread by capitalism that liberated women from daily drudgery. What is troubling in too many books and articles by feminist journalists in the US, despite their putative leftism, is an implicit privileging of bourgeois values and culture. The particular focused clerical and managerial skills of the upper middle class elite are presented as the highest desideratum, the ultimate evolutionary point of humanity. But Rosen's triumphalism about women's gains seems startlingly premature when she says of the sagging fortunes of today's working class couples that they and we had, quote, reached the end of 100,000 years of human history and the beginning of a new era, and there was no going back, close quote. This sweeping appeal to history somehow overlooks history's far darker lessons about the cyclic rise and fall of civilizations, which as they become more complex and interconnected, also become more vulnerable to collapse. The earth is littered with the ruins of empires that believed they were eternal. After the next inevitable apocalypse, men will be desperately needed again. Oh sure, there will be the odd gun-toting Amazonian survivalist gal who can rustle game out of the bush and feed her flock, but most women and children will be expecting men to scrounge for food and water and defend the home turf. Indeed, men are absolutely indispensable right now, invisible as it is to most feminists who seem blind to the infrastructure that makes their own work lives possible. It is overwhelmingly men who do the dirty, dangerous work of building roads, pouring concrete, laying bricks, tarring roofs, hanging electric wires, excavating natural gas and sewage lines, cutting and clearing trees, and bulldozing the landscape for housing developments. It is men who heft and weld the giant steel beams that frame our office buildings. It is men who do the hair-raising work of insetting and sealing the finely tempered plate glass windows of skyscrapers 30 stories tall. Every day along the Delaware River in Philadelphia, one can watch the passage of vast oil tankers and towering cargo ships arriving from all over the world. These stately colossi are loaded, steered, and offloaded by men. The modern economy, with its vast production and distribution network, is a male epic in which women have found a productive role, but women were not its author. Surely modern women are strong enough now to give credit where credit is due. Oh. Maureen Dowd, you are up for your opening statement, please. Um, I've never debated before, and I am so screwed. (laughs) (laughs) Even though I grew up in the shadow of the Washington Monument, the jutting Freudian symbol of a capital under male dominion for centuries, I always knew that men were doomed. That's because I was raised on a steady diet of femme fatales. I love film noir, and film noir has one inviolable rule, deadly is the female. (laughs) Guys who could be framed easier than Whistler's mother tangle with women who are trouble. And the guys always end up looking like they took a hayride with Dracula. (laughs) Film noir is about lady killers and women who aren't ladies. And the women who aren't ladies wind up killing the lady killers. The men seem under a dark spell, as though they know their futures are all used up, and that femme fatales have the right to pursue happiness in all directions. A classic film noir exchange is, man, you're never around when I need you. Woman, you never need me when I'm around. (laughs) These mesmerizing black widows make love to their prey and then consume them, which is actually a fairly common practice in nature. 
Since we're coming up on Valentine's Day, I'll mention that there are more than 80 species that feature leech babes that devour their male lovers before, during, and after mating. <laughs> Praying mantises, green spoon worms, there's the tiny female midge who plunges her proboscis into the male midge's head during procreation. <laughs> Her spittle turning his insides to soup, which she then enjoys as an apres sex snack. <laughs> Beats a cigarette. <laughs> the male orb weaving spider kills himself before the female has a chance to kill him, <laughs> turning himself into a plug to prevent other males from copulating, thus ensuring his genes are more likely to live on. Even more ingenious gene-wise are the whiptail lizards in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, who procreate on a purely female basis, no males required. Oh, what a tangled gender web we weave. As the great Ida Lupino said in Roadhouse, doesn't it ever enter a man's head that a woman can do without him? Women have finally clicked their ruby stilettos three times and realized they have the power. <laughs> Norman Mailer used to be terrified that women were going to take over the world and punish men for being bad to them over the centuries. All women needed, he said, were about 100 semen slaves that they could milk every day to keep the race going and have the earth all to themselves. <laughs> Dream on, Norman. All women need is a few cells in the freezer next to the cherry-flavored vodka and we're all set. Men are so last century. <laughs> they seem to have stopped evolving, sulking like Achilles in his tent. Evolutionary bi biologists were predicting that in the next 100,000 to 10 million years, men could disappear, taking video games, Game of Thrones on a continuous loop, and cold pizza in the morning with them. <laughs> The Y chromosome, as renowned evolutionary biologist David Page told me, fell asleep at the wheel 200 million years ago and was headed toward the cliff. But Page and others have now learned that suddenly, about 20 million years ago, the Y woke up and veered away from the cliff, repairing itself with duplicates of its own genes. Page deduced that the Y said to itself, I don't have a lot left, but what I have left, I'm going to keep. While the Y was shrinking, the X, formerly considered a staid, pristine relic, was growing larger and stronger, acquiring new bunches of genes, some of which play roles in producing sperm. So all those centuries when you guys were asleep at the wheel, we were tinkering under the hood. <laughs> when I wrote my book, Are Men Necessary?, my mom told me to change the title to Men Are Necessary, period. You hurt their feelings, she said. <laughs> So I want to end with a truism the comedian Sarah Silverman tweeted recently. Dear men, just because we don't need you anymore doesn't mean we don't want you. Love forever, women. <laughs> men obsolete? If men are obsolete, then I personally aspire to this level of obsolescence. Holding 99% of the world's wealth, totaling 66 of Forbes' 71 most powerful people in the world list, being every single Pope, American President and Secretary General of the UN, and in charge of every military force on Earth. If this is men becoming obsolete, I'm intrigued to see what they will be able to achieve once they've downloaded some manner of software update. Men are doing quite well, all things considered. Of course, I understand the general argument here. We've basically got a shifting global labor market that increasingly favors someone who can spend 10 hours a day wearing a headset, eating Reese's Pieces, and making emotionally intelligent chitty chat. We favor them over someone who can break a pig in half with their bare hands. <laughs> Whilst men might not currently be obsolescent, the future does look 100% female. Except, if true, that would suck as much as when the past was 100% male. I don't have many rules in life other than do not eat feta cheese that tastes fizzy. <laughs> but my big one is be polite. All harm and wrong in the world occurs when people forget to be polite. 
Ladies, remember how annoyed we were when men said that women were obsolete? How all those millennia of men treating women as like second-class citizens seemed impolite? And we took all that Valium and essentially self-harmed by getting massive perms. <laughs> Let's not now do the same thing back to men. Not least because the statistics that suggest that men are becoming obsolete aren't the kind of men that I wish would become obsolete, asshats in private jets furthering the various sundry causes of evil, but essentially working class men. Given that my feminism is A, strident, B, fueled by cocktails and C, Marxist, <laughs> I'm kind of not really up for women with soaring prospects dumping on working class men who are essentially just standing around and going, where have all the jobs in low paid pig halving gone? And why is my wife making her hair so huge, dry and curly? I'm confused and unhappy. Look, my feminism is neither pro-women nor anti-men, but thumbs up for the seven billion. Thumbs up for everyone on this little blue-green planet trying to get through the day. In a world of infinite trouble, the idea of equality isn't some fabulous luxury that we can gift ourselves when we're feeling morally flush. Equality is not humanity's cashmere bed socks. It's not a present like champagne. Absolute human equality is a necessity like water. Because if we look at a map of the world where every nation struggling with poverty, child mortality and political instability is marked in red, it's notable that its bright red shaming rash coincides almost identically with the most unequal countries in the world. In the 21st century, humanity's greatest resource isn't oil or titanium or gold, it's brains. Any time we make a choice as a society to offline a section of society, we waste these billions of tons of brains, a million ways for the world to be better. And this is equally true when men said for 100,000 years, women will never happen, as it would be now for women to say for the next 100,000 years, men are obsolete. If feminism is the simple, truthful observation that women should be equal to men, then the future is that we must do everything to achieve that, whether in some cases it's men helping women achieve equality, or in other cases, women helping men achieve equality. We need, with urgency, to stop terming things in terms of problems of men and problems of women, and start seeing all problems for what they are, the problems of humanity. Women cannot win if men are losing, and vice versa, because we all live quite near to each other. We keep having sex with each other, and giving birth to each other, and being related to each other. When half of us falls, the other half staggers. If working class men are struggling, the first people it will impact on are working class women. It's easy to forget this, but we are the same species. Women are not from Venus, and men are not from Mars. I know because I shared a bunk bed with my brother and unfortunately for him at the time I discovered masturbation, he was not 34.8 million miles away. <laughs> Good. Anyway, if men do become obsolete, if men do become obsolete, then as anyone who studies popular culture will tell you, it won't be for long. They'll be phased out for 10 years and disappear, and then some hipster will find one in a thrift store and go, oh my God, do you remember when we had men? It'd be like so ironic and amusing if I had one of these back in my house. And suddenly men will be fashionable again, and you'll have to pay 900 pounds for them on eBay. And people will start making them on Etsy out of bits of wire and beads. Do we want that? No. Think about it. Do women gain anything from men becoming obsolete? If we are the only ones triumphing in work and education, economy and politics and business, but yet we still retain our old kingdoms of homemaking and child raising, do we win? No, because if that happens, then we will be doing everything. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I'm quite knackered. The question is, are men obsolete? And my conclusion to this question is no. I won't let you be, you f***ers. We are going 50-50 on this one. Hannah, I've seen you diligently taking notes through these opening statements, and because you spoke first, I want to give you the first chance to rebut something that you've heard on the other side. Anything that I've heard 
on yeah, look, I mean, what, what jumps out is you at saying, look, you've got it wrong. Oh, on just this, this point. idea that, like, somehow this is being mean to men. It's like, if it were up to me, we would just put all the damn factories back in all the places where the men have lost their jobs. Like, talking about what the truth is is not the same as being mean. Like, there's this thing about men where you're never supposed to say that they need any help or you're never supposed to say that they're suffering in any way because that is mean or that's degrading them. It's just the truth. Like, we just have to face the truth that, like, there's a certain kind of men are sort of disappearing from the face of the earth and you got to try and help them and you can't help them unless you tell the truth. So... Is very even-handed. There, there is no, none of the rancor that I, I spoke of. I, I think in, in your book, but it does seem to me there are, there's an, an unfairness in so far as the only men who gain voice in your book are those who are willing to confess their victim status, and, and, I, and I, I felt that there was a kind of a, an absence of the very strong voices of men that I hear as I listen to a sports radio, which I, I, I do around the clock. You in, listen in to the, sports radio? I, yes, that is the only awesome. place where working-class men can be heard in our culture. Uh, and you, you, men are calling from trucks, from highways, from construction spots, and so on. Men who have not graduated from high school but can analyze in incredible detail exactly what was wrong with the defensive line of the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday. Okay. Right. Well, do I, you like hang out at construction sites? <laughs> I, 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 since my books, since my first book, Sexual Personae, I have sung the praises of construction as a sublime male poetry, and I, th I think that the indifference of um, the upper middle class feminists, okay, to the actual labor that is going on all around us by these men who are very gallant in their silent service, I think is a distortion, okay, that is... Well, let's bring, can uh, I, can yeah, Ka Catelyn, come in this because you are a self-described Marxist, so yes. surely you have a classical Marxist analysis here for well, us. Well, first of all, I just want to say that although the nobility of construction is amazing, I did get ripped off on my double glazing <laughs> by the last guys that came into my house, so do get recommendations, not all men are trustworthy builders. Um, I just want to point out the um, I just want to point out the irony of the fact that it's taken four women to discuss the end of men. Like, why aren't men discussing this and working out what they're going to do next? Kind of, you know, in a world where you know why they're not the discussing it because they just pretend it's not happening. Yeah. Like they just sort of crawl off and pretend it's not happening, which right. just drives me nuts. It's just quite funny though, you know, kind of we're multitasking anyway. We're doing everything and we're also right. going to men. You're kind of ending. Come on, come on, come on. Get a plan together. Come on, we're taking over. Come on, we're going to help. You out here. But Catelyn, address what I mean, it's happening in the UK as much as in North America. There is now, you line it up education, uh, work participation, family life. There is a type of man out there who is, who is falling behind, has fallen behind in a pretty profound way. What's driving that in society? Oh, well, I mean, well, capitalism, obviously. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's quite first. I mean, the thing that I think is very important is, you know, and sort of like, you know, as I've learned more about feminism as I've gone along, that it's very important, and I sort of said that in the speech, that we stop talking about problems of men and problems of women and talk about problems of humanity. This isn't a question of kind of women overtaking men. It's a question of, of the economy changing. The global economy is changing. And I think, it, you know, it's a massive diversionary tactic that we kind of, you know, that we phrase it as men against women, where it's, you know, it's the underclasses and the peasants that need to revolt against the oppressive, the, the oppressive, <laughs> I will say I'm fairly neutral on whether the end of men is good or bad. Like, I, I don't think the end of men is, like, totally awesome and women win and, like, yay, yay, yay. Some parts of the stuff I describe in my book is, like, terrible, that there are no dads around or, or that women have to do absolutely everything. I'm just saying it's happening. I'm not saying it's awesome. I'm just saying it is, you know? I, I don't accept this dark view of men um, fading on the world economic landscape. I just don't accept it. And, and a, a part of my opening statement I didn't have time to read is that um, I've been calling for 20 years for a revalorization of the trades in modern education. I, I feel that, um, that there is a very banal uh, compulsory college track these days in, in primary schools with funneling uh, smart students along to a university curriculum that's extremely <laughs> vapid. And, and that what is needed is much more of a, there, there, something like this going on in Germany, which is cooperation uh, between primary schools and industry and, and real vocational technical training going on. I, mean, I, I think that the, the, the upper middle class has to get over its social snobbery about manual labor. Because I've been teaching in arts... Hmm. 
Okay, hold it. Well, Camille, let's have the other side yeah, come so back Yeah, so I would this. say I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's why I talk about this stuff. Yeah. It, it, it collides perfectly with the huge problem of income inequality, which is like the biggest sin that's going on right now all over the world. And so, so you keep saying, look, these guys are hurting, these guys are hurting, these guys are hurting, and then maybe someday someone will do something about it. I always talk about Germany because Germany has this like yeah. great respect for the dudes who can, you know, make the perfect, excellent refrigerator mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish we had such great respect for those dudes. Camille, you want to jump in on that? Well, I, I'm just saying that I've, I've been teaching for 40 years in art schools right, where, where, where people work with their hands. And I come out of an Italian-American culture where to work with your hands and to make beautiful things and, to, to, you know, and the, not, not just art objects, but things with fabric and, 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 you know, and, and metal and, and basket weaving and so on, and leather. Um, and I said, that's what we need to do. We need to, to raise up you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the cultural status of, of manual labor. And I think that well, we this, this is, to me, it's one point, of central points yeah. about the, the low esteem with which, in which working class men are held is partly due to this shift to a very snobbish, uh, up, you know, white upper middle class elite sensibility in the Let's just, okay, Callan, no, I, but I, I mean, Camille, you're always here. thinking like this is feminists putting this out there. This is no, it's not feminist. It's no. just the reality. It's yes, like right. the manufacturing era is over. Right. Feminists didn't like create some fiction right. about the working yeah. class man. Yeah. The working class man is screwed right now. No, can, can I also just stick it for the idea of kind of you know middle class elitist the academic feminist of which I'm not one. I never even went to school. But um, <laughs> but but can can we not have both the idea? that we could revive, you know, kind of, the thing is, you know, with men and women, if men have created something, we can keep that and preserve that and keep that going. And then women can go off and create something new and the two can run side by side. It's not like one system has to win out over the other. Maureen, let's have you come in on, the, on this point. I'm just, you know, manliness today, that I, iconic image of the construction worker, it's not really as much of the male identity now as it was a generation ago. No, I think we just need to... Um, reassure men and, um, you know, that they can lie back and relax and relinquish some of the burdens of responsibility that you've carried so sturdily for millennia. <laughs> Try on a frilly apron over your white beater t-shirt. See how fetching it looks while you fetch. Rather than being a boring old necessity, you are now a luxury like ice cream. <laughs> now, Camille, this is, this is what you rally against, this kind of uh, ornamentalization of men. You think men are quite different in terms of the trajectory of civilization. Yes, yes, yes. In fact, one of the things that kind of rankled me in, in Hannah's book, at one point where she says that manhood has, has so receded that pickup trucks are now mere accessories, okay? In other words, and that, that really bothered me because it, it's simply not true of the contractors who arrive at my suburban house, you know, what to do with the lawn and the roof and everything. The pickup trucks are not accessories yeah, for I'm working class Brooklyn. men. Yeah, but I'm talking about Brooklyn, where you walk into a shop in Brooklyn, and no doubt Toronto, and in that shop, it's like this sort of ornamentalized masculinity. So the dudes from Brooklyn, they have a beard, you know, they, they buy a flask and a Playboy. Like, that's all that these shops sell. They sell lumberjack shirts, flasks, and a Playboy. That, you know, there it's ornamental, like in other places. Well, I, I just, um, as a student of history, I just have a sense of um, foreboding about, um, you know, processes that are at work in the world. I think, just think it's incredibly, pardon me, with all due respect, naive, okay, to, to think that we are moving towards some sort of a, you know, an ec economic paradise where the women are going to gain control. I, I think that uh, with, the, with the women's advance is, is one of many things in the West that, that um, jihadists consider decadent. Okay? I think it's, you know, it's one of, one of the targets of, 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 of jihadism. And that, um, you know, I, I I've studied my entire life the, the, the fate of Rome and how Rome thought it would last forever, but there were these like, determined bands of vandals, very fast moving, who were able to, to bring that culture down. So I, 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 I'm concerned about anything which undermines the, um, the identity or prestige of men because I, as I do believe there are going to be political consequences um, to, a, to a culture where women, are, women who, are, who tend 
in general, in a non-militaristic direction. We think that you know, we're heading toward a nanny state mentality where we're just going to cater to, to, um, to, to social needs and that there's no, need, and there's no necessity for us to remain vigilant about the future. So, I, so, I, so I, like, I'm very concerned. So what, w so what would you have us do, just like plug the men's ears and pretend it's not happening, just be like, it's okay, it's okay. No, You're I, okay. I, 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 want to, I want to build up men's sense of masculine identity again. I, I want to liberate education. I think that, I think that um, uh, our, our primary school system is uh, constructed like a prison. Yes. And that it, it, it teaches absolutely nothing except socially approved and trendy thoughts. That's all. Yes, and it totally favors girls. And so until yes. you are actually yes. honest about the boy right. crisis, until you actually allow people to hear the word that boys are mm -hmm. like seriously suffering in school, right. You know, in America, people have been talking about the boy crisis since 1990, and we pretend still it's not happening because we can't accept this idea that boys might need help or that boys are suffering, so we're just like, it's okay, everything's okay. Yes, but it's, it's not okay. As you point out, when Christina Hoff Summers raised these issues, um, many people said, oh, this is not true, and now it's become absolute common wisdom, okay, that, that yes, boys are in crisis. And, the, and the, as far as I'm concerned, the way to do it is to really look at our educational system. I think that, that, it, that it is, um, it's toxic. It's toxic for creativity. It, it, it produces clones. Okay, it, it produces uh, people who have been who are deprived of, of energy and thought. Uh, and we have a, an extremely um, it's a mediocre educational system right now that is that is whittling down male initiative and is and is compounding this problem. And I and I, I, I totally acknowledge Hannah's overall point about the you know this uh, long transition between the uh, the old manufacturing base and the in the in the white collar. But, uh, but Camille, guess what? It, you're agreeing with Hannah. So what I'm trying to understand is, do you think this is a moment, a phase, it will pass, and that? qualities of, of maleness and male identity will reassert themselves, so therefore things will be better in the future? I guess what I'm no, I, I'm saying to... that, no, I, I say maleness is not going to reassert itself until we, re, until we re revolutionize uh, the educational system. And another thing I've, I've been calling for is, uh, is for um, us to be looking at the, the way young women are put onto a male track in terms of their own college and graduate and postgraduate you know, education. That, that, that there's no room in, in there for you know, wiggle room for um, an ambitious, smart, and talented young woman to decide that she would like to have children early. I'm, so I've been I've been calling for um, for colleges and universities who profess to in, to endorse women's rights to be much more flexible. That's in, a very good in, point. In part time let's, education. Let's have, let's have Maureen come in on that because you know, luckily we're not the United States where what do you get? three, four weeks of maternity leave. I mean, there are a lot of st structural barriers in American society and Western yeah. society that prevent women from being as successful as they would like to be. So doesn't that suggest that men aren't obsolete? Um, yes, well, obviously we should be more like France in, in that respect in terms of healthcare for women. But um, I, wanted, I just wanted to tell a funny story because I've um, spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia and um, so the last time I was there, I was doing a feature for Vanity Fair and traveling around. And um, so I had read that the grave of, the, of Eve, the original Eve, was in Saudi Arabia. So I asked my guide to take me there. And he just looked at me like I was crazy. And he goes, you can't go there. You're a woman. <laughs> for a second, I tried to reason with him and explain why a woman should be allowed to see Eve's grave. <laughs> but um, Saudi Arabia, at least, is still more modern than the Catholic Church. So there's a lot of work to be done there. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Hannah, I can tell you want to come in on this point. Which one? Are we talking well, about Well, just the structural leave barriers that suggest that, I mean, you've written about this, these structural barriers, maternity leave, how the workplace is set up so that, you know, work hours, the very structure of modern professional life often is antithetical to a lot of the things that women want to do and how they want to live. Yeah, so we're actually the worst. We don't actually have any maternity leave that's paid at all, and we're maybe one of three countries that doesn't, so it's actually very pathetic. And so the American workplace actually doesn't recognize the, the person as a whole human being who might have 
other needs. But, it, but if I had my druthers, I actually wouldn't like do the Swedish system where you have a year of you know, maternity leave because that puts all sorts of pressures on women to behave in a certain way and they actually have a more gender unequal workplace than we do. I think what you have to do is, is actually Sweden 2.0, which is consider it a kind of gender neutral proposition. Like you have men and women can take time off, which is I think what Canada just did. Or you do what France does and like focus on child care rather than just maternity leave. So you create a thing where it's not like women. So the employer's not only looking at the women and saying, oh, they're the ones who are gonna screw me and take a year off. It's like everybody's job to take care of the children, not just the women's job, even though women like do it more. You're listening to the Monk Debates podcast. If you like this podcast, check out our other episodes, including debates on everything from the U.S. election to the effectiveness of COVID lockdowns to whether it's time to defund the police. All free to download or stream on our website, monkdebates.com. Okay, we are going to go into uh, closing statements. Um, that was a great discussion. And uh, as we agreed beforehand, we're going to have the closing statements in the opposite order. Catelyn Morin is going first. You're up. Three minutes. Okay, two things. One, life on Earth is an experiment. We are a blue-green Petri dish. And two, if you add up all the oppressed minorities of the world, so that's all the women, all the LGBT people, all the disabled and all the people of colour, that's about 80 to 90% of the world. Straight white men, the patriarchy, have shaped and ruled our world for 100,000 years on what is basically a skeleton staff. You know, they are a tiny, (laughs) tiny proportion of the world. They are basically the night shift. They are the holiday cover. And in that time, they raised the pyramids and put Stonehenge in the middle of Salisbury Plains and invented the gods and the Rickenbacker guitar and New York and Twitter and John Frieda Frizzy's serum and Lycra. Yada, 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 oppression, yes, but you can't deny they got shit done. So, back to life on Earth being an experiment. And the most fascinating experiment that we have the potential to run right now is A, seeing what women turn out to be when they're not afraid and they are empowered and they're not impoverished and have achieved equality. And then B, what as a consequence men will turn out to be when they have women as their equals and finally debate these things together. What will men turn into? Um, How will the triumphing of feminism make us all evolve? I'm so excited to see what little boys will be like when they grow up in a world filled with female presidents and female sports stars and a band that they call the New Beatles that is all female and his friends scream at that band in the way that girls used to scream at the Beatles. And then how in turn girls will change when they see boys reacting like that. The kaleidoscopic, dizzying wonder of everything that can happen makes me so excited. We are so early on in the experiment of what it is to be a human on Earth, and we have so much to look forward to if we hold our nerve. We are on the brink of being able to turn into a whole new species. When we merge physically in the old-fashioned way, we make that most astonishing and precious and awe-inspiring thing, a baby, a new human, a small, infinite future. Imagine what we will make when we merge on every level by merging our intellectual and emotional chemistry into the first ever society that is equally male and female, when we collaborate on humanity 2.0. How will this change our fundamental ideas of gender and sexuality, what is normal and natural, what is actually female and male? Basically, I'm imagining a world full of moonwalking pansexual David Bowies and Janelle Monet's here, and... (laughs) I've genuinely never heard of any better plans for the future than that. So, if you vote against this motion, that is scientifically what we are guaranteed to get. Guaranteed. Literally cash back if you don't. Although, bear in mind, I do get on a plane at 6 a.m. tomorrow and my cell phone goes straight to answer phone. Thank you. Well done, Catelyn. Up next, uh, Maureen Dowd, your final three-minute statement, please. Okay, I'm going to talk really fast. I didn't want to mention this the first time around, given that you are my host, but in order to prove definitively that men are not necessary, I only need two words, Ted Cruz. (laughs) I come here seeking refuge from the apocalyptic terror of Ted Cruz's Thunderdome. How on earth did a Canadian almost destroy America? (laughs) Canadians are usually so nice. 
For centuries, it was widely thought that women were biologically unsuited to hold leadership positions. It was felt that power was best wielded by men because men were impersonal, unemotional, forthright, and reasonable. Now it is the highly unstable male, male temperament that is causing alarm. Male politicians are engaging in sneaky, catty, weepy, ditzy, shrewish behavior that is anything but reasonable and impersonal. We can't even count on men to be effective tech geeks given the situation with Obama's rollout on health care. <laughs> Women are affected by lunar tides only once a month. Men have raging hormones every day. <laughs> As we notice when Dick Cheney rampaged around the globe like Godzilla. Rob Ford, your hot mess of a mayor, has had many wild outbursts that, if he were a woman, would certainly be labeled hysteria, from the Greek for womb. But who but a hysteric excuses himself for smoking crack by saying he was in a drunken stupor? <laughs> <laughs> and then talks to reporters about his adventures with lady parts. <laughs> I do want one of those bobbleheads, though. <laughs> Ted Cruz is a scary mean girl. He threw a hissy fit over Obamacare that shut down the government for 16 days and cost the American economy $24 billion. Rand Paul, the libertarian senator from Kentucky, grew sulky and needed a fainting couch which, when Rachel Maddow blasted out that he was a kleptomaniac with Wikipedia. The most emotional member of Congress is Speaker John Boehner, who starts blubbering into his Merlot at the slightest sentimental provocation. <laughs> Unlike his macho Democratic counterpart, Nancy Pelosi, he's not adept at math and counting. He keeps acting ditzy, bringing Tea Party bills to the floor of the House that do not have the votes to pass. If you want to talk about caddy behavior, consider this. Ken Cuccinelli refused to call Terry McAuliffe after the Virginia governor's race to congratulate him. Men played so rough and heedlessly with the globe, they almost broke it. So we're going in a different direction. Heck, they wouldn't even ask for directions. <laughs> and no, Sarah Palin, that still does not mean you. <laughs> So uh, you had eight minutes or eight seconds left. Let's give uh, Hannah, we'll p pass it over to you, Hannah. We'll give you a little bit of grace when you speak last. Up next, though, is Camille Paglia. Camille, your three minutes, please. I was raised in the 1950s when it was uh, unheard of for women to be ambitious for a career. And um, with the arrival of the women's movement in the late uh, 1960s, now uh, uh, young women feel that every career path is, is um, open to them. What I'm concerned about is that feminism has um, painted itself into a corner and is now completely invisible, really. I mean, there are, there are sites on the web that, where, that attract um, uh, committed feminists, but they're completely invisible. Feminism has absolutely no uh, important profile right, right now in, in the US. Um, I, I feel that feminism has drifted from um, any sense of what most people are looking for, um, in, for, in, for value in life. The, a career is extremely important, but ultimately, other things become more important as you age. I, I um, often walk on the um, New, Jer New Jersey shore in a very working class um, area, the wild woods, and I'm very moved by seeing these working class families, multi-generations, uh, vacationing together. Something that the um, upper middle class ceases to do uh, you know, as it becomes more affluent. People take, take their own separate vacations. And I, I see there um, the, uh, the joy that elderly people take in, in what they have wrought. You have, you have multiple generations vacationing um, together, and these old people I can barely get to the shore, or, or, you know, to the edge of the water, are sitting in these deck chairs and, and watching as their, as their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are, are running around. No matter what you've done in life, no matter what your status, no matter how much power you've achieved, how much wealth, a point comes where it's all meaningless. There's nothing left 
but a sense of what you've contributed to life itself. I'm very concerned okay, that the Western obsession with career success and with status and wealth is actually uh, perverting and distorting our sense of the, you know, of the spiritual dimension okay, and of, of the meaning of, of life itself. I think that feminism needs a major correction back. Okay? First of all, re uh, lifting the you know the value of children. There's all this talk about childcare and maternity leave and so on. But in point of fact, the feminist movement, second wave feminism, has acted in a way uh, that has tended to denigrate this, the stay-at-home mom. Okay, and it, in fact, in its obsession with abortion, okay, has made it seem as if it, as if it's anti-life. Okay. Thank you, uh, Camille. That applause does creep up on us faster than we might think. Um, Hannah Rosen, you get the very last word tonight. All right, I'll take it. So I think that there's some confusion out there about what you're voting for if you vote for us. So when we say men are obsolete, that doesn't mean they're worthless or we want to stomp on them or we hate them. Uh, it means something different, and, and I'm trying to think about it. I think you can think about it as being outmoded. So, so let's say the twin combustion engine technically makes the bicycle obsolete. But that doesn't mean that we hate the bicycle or we want to throw the bicycle away. It just means that you want to use the bicycle exactly how you want to while recognizing that there's some need for efficiency and change. And I think the same is true for men. So you are allowed <laughs> to preserve the parts of manhood that you love and value whether that's craftsmanship or, you know, macho-ness or, you know, eating nachos and playing video games, whatever it is about the manhood that you love, you should preserve at the same time recognizing that there need to be some adjustment if men, and particularly certain men, are going to survive in the modern world. Secondly, I think you think that by voting for us, you are voting for some kind of crazy triumphalist feminism, and women won, and we like stomp on your Carhartt jackets and steal your pickup trucks, and we are really happy about it. But that's not true. It's, like I said, it's neither good or bad. You are just voting, acknowledging a reality. So when Camille said that we don't you know, recognize these things as valuable anymore, we don't have vocational programs to respect men, I totally agree with that, but that means that you should vote for our side, because then you're just recognizing the reality of what's going on. Thirdly, I think that you think that if you're voting for us, you're somehow blinded to the fact that men are the majority of CEOs or popes or whatever, like popes, who cares about popes, but anyway. Um, <laughs> Yes, they are. That's absolutely true. But that's just a moment in time. If you look at the trends, it's completely obvious that that world is not going to last. And finally, I would say, you should just be brave enough to tell the truth about this, especially you men out there. Don't pretend it's not happening. I mean, I have a husband who totally still speaks to me, even after a year of me talking about the end of men. I have one son who still speaks to me and another son who doesn't, but that's beside the fact. <laughs> But I would just say, like hiding our heads in the sand and pretending that there's no boy crisis, there's no crisis in working class men, that there isn't a crisis in masculinity is not the way to go. I would urge you all to acknowledge the truth and vote for us. Well, that wraps up our podcast of a memorable Monk debate held at Roy Thompson Hall in Toronto, Canada back in a time when it still was possible to argue persuasively in person. Prior to the debate, we polled the audience on their views on the resolution. Be it resolved, men are obsolete. The results were 16% only in favor of the motion, fully 84% opposed. When we polled the audience at the end of the debate, opinions had changed dramatically. 44% agreed that men are obsolete, and only 56 were opposed. The pro side gained 28%, and so they were declared the evening's victors. I want to thank our speakers who participated in this main stage monk debate, Anna Rosen, Maureen Dowd, Camille Paglia, and Catlin Morin. They show that even on a contentious issue, it is possible to share opposing views in a civil and substantive way. Thank you for helping us bring back the art of public debate, one conversation at a time. I'm your moderator, Rudyard Griffiths. 
The Monk Debates are produced by Antica Productions and supported by the Monk Foundation. Rudyard Griffiths, Marilyn Mazurek, and Christina Campbell are the producers. The Monk Debates podcast is mixed by Kieran Lynch. The president of Antica Productions is Stuart Cox. Be sure to download and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like us, feel free to give us a five-star rating. Thanks again for listening.